Let's pray together. Father, we, um, we do pause and before we open your word to recognize, as always, how needy we are. We uh, want to make room for you. Um, Father, we want to acknowledge the fact that without you, we are hopeless. But with you, we have all the hope of eternity. And so God, thank you for our time together to worship together as the people of God gather together, whether we're in person or online. God, as we open up the word of God, we ask that the spirit of God would hover over it like you did in the beginning and bring forth life. God, thank you for the, the fact that it has been your desire and will to have a relationship with us. And even when we broke it, you pursued us. And so we ask that you would continue to do that now. And as we read your word, as I preach your word, God, I pray that you would uh, move. Move in our midst, God, that your Holy Spirit would fill this place, fill us. Because we know that you have put the power in your word. And so, God, we ask you now to bring it forth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you got a Bible, you can open it up to Genesis chapter 32. And if you don't have a Bible, don't worry about it. As always, we'll have the verses on the screen, or you can use your Bible app, uh, and we'll just go on the honor system that you're not actually checking scores or text messages or on Instagram or anything like that, all right? Uh, but we're in this series called Welcome to the Wrestle, and this is now the eight, uh, eighth week of the series. And it's one of those that has been really enjoyable for me to preach. Uh, I hope it's been enjoyable for you to listen to. And when I say enjoyable, what I mean by that is it is uh, not necessarily fun subject matter, but it's enjoyable for us to talk about something that we all go through because then it kind of normalizes the situation. It normalizes what we all go through because whenever we're wrestling, whenever we're struggling, one of the greatest lies of the enemy is you're the only one who's ever done this. You're the only one who's ever struggled. You're the only one who is ever going through something like this. You're the only one who's ever had a dysfunctional family, right? Have you ever felt like that? I mean, let's just be honest. Has it been a little, little comforting when you're in the grocery store and you see somebody else's kids act up, right? And you're like, oh, thank, thank you, Jesus. Like, not that you're, you know, wanting cursings on that mama, but you're like, oh, okay, good. I'm not the only dysfunctional one, right? And so it's been enjoyable from that standpoint. What I mean, again, is for us to kind of have a conversation about here's what life is like. Here's what God does with us. God wrestles us. And so we have had to learn how to welcome it. That's why we call the series Welcome to the Wrestle. And, and I think it's good, especially eight weeks in now, for us to just, just to say that one last time. All right? What do you think? We just need to, we just need to welcome it one last time. And so if you're new, what I'm going to do is we're all going to, on the count of three, say, welcome to the wrestle. And we're going to say it, though, in our best wrestling WWE voice, all right? And so just a little pointers, because if you're going to follow along with me, I'm going to drag out welcome real long, all right? And I'm going to say it loud from the diaphragm, all right? And we're going to welcome it one last time, because in Genesis chapter 32, we're going to dig into the wrestle today, all right? So you ready? Even if you're online... Yell back to the, to the screen, all right, with us, and we can all do this together, all right? Here we go. On, on three, we're going to say welcome to the wrestle. One, two, three. Welcome to the wrestle. There we go. Very nicely done. All right. That was good. I've gotten so many requests, primarily from kids, uh, to do that again, and now that we don't have our family environment. They're all upset that they didn't get to do it again. Uh, but we can go back and watch it together. Or you can just have that fun time in your house, all right? Uh, if, in fact, parents, when you're waking your kids up in the morning, you can just open up the lights, turn on the lights, and, and say that with them, all right? So Genesis chapter 32, let's jump in. We're going to look at the verses that we ended with last week. And I'm going to kind of hit that again because there's another point I want to make there. And then we're going to dig into the other parts of it. So verse 22, we're going to go all the way to verse... 
32. It says, the same night, he, Jacob, arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children, and, co- and crossed the ford of the Jabuk, that's the river. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had, and Jacob was left alone. Again, okay, my contention last week was, no matter what is going on in our life, no matter what we try to fill in our life, no matter what we try to add, no, what, no matter what we try to, to use to make us happy, there's going to come a point in time in our life where we find ourselves alone, by ourselves, and our good and gracious God will meet us there, and that's what happens. And look at the rest of that verse. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Now, that's where the whole idea of this series came from, right? God wrestles with Jacob. And, and in this scenario, again, I've given you all the backstory of Jacob's life and who he is and why God comes to him and why God feels the need to wrestle with him. But there's something that I want to, again, kind of dig around here a little bit. And, and I, I touched on it last week, but I want to I want to hit it again, because if we're not careful, when the wrestle comes, when God meets with us, and, and this is what I pointed out, I mean, God meets with Jacob arguably at one of the most stressful moments in his life, and then just add stress to it by wrestling with him. I mean, here's Jacob coming from the dysfunctional family, all the things that happened there. He leaves, he runs from that, goes and starts his own family 14 years away, doesn't go the, the way that he thought. Now, he's, instead of one wife, he's got two. And then the, uh, the Bible says that God says, go back to your family, go back and deal with all that stuff behind you. And so he's on his way to do that. He's so afraid. He's so scared because he's tricked Esau. He thinks Esau is going to kill him. Now he's got two wives, 11 kids, and he's all alone. And then this man shows up to wrestle him. Don't you imagine when that happens, Jacob was thinking, this is the last thing in the world I need right now. Like I got 11 kids. I'm trying to get some sleep. And this man shows up at night and wrestles him. And what is Jacob's reaction? Jacob's reaction is just like mine and your reaction all the time. When the wrestle comes, what do we do? We power up in our own strength and try to survive it. Try to get through it. And my whole contention in this series is maybe God doesn't want you to survive it. Maybe he wants you to surrender in it. So here's my point, and you might want to write this down. And again, we'll move on in just a minute, but I want to hang here for a second. Don't power through the pain because it's designed to lead to deep change. Don't power through the pain. Now, I say this often. This is not unique to just men, but men are probably the most stubborn in this area. And again, we don't need any elbows or amens from you ladies in the house, all right? But when grief comes, or when pain comes, or when discomfort comes, our natural MO is to power up in the strength of our flesh and get through it and survive it because that's what we learn to do, particularly if you grew up In a dysfunctional family, you learned how to survive. You learned how to comfort yourself. You learned how to encourage yourself. You learned how to deal with the problems that you were facing by just powering up and getting through it. And listen, I'm not saying that when those things happen in our childhood that we necessarily did anything sinful or wrong, because in some circumstances, that's all we got. But here's what I'm getting at. But you'll get to a point where God will meet with you and he will design circumstances to the point that power up past your ability to power up. That that break you beyond your ability to break through it. Let me say it to you like this. There, There will come a day where the circumstances will be such that you won't know how to get through it. And it's right at that moment that that is God bringing you to your breaking point so he can get you to break through to a new reality 
that yes, you can't do it, but he can. It gets you to this point, again, this is what I was saying last week, that breaks you out of self-reliance. That, that gets you past this, this, uh, this uh, not that any of us think that we're superhuman. We know that we can't fly, but you know, we can't do all that and you know, bound off of buildings and stuff like that. However, we live our lives emotionally like that. We live our lives emotionally like we don't need God and we don't need deep relationships with other people. We're good. We got it. And this is why I mean, my staff and my, my family know this, that I learned how to function as a kid in my dysfunction, and that function in itself became dysfunctional. So dysfunctional that I don't like it. I'm just confessing to you. I don't like it when people ask me how I'm doing. Two reasons. Normally, they don't actually really care. And I don't want to just have small talk, right? But really the reason is, is because I just live with this mentality of, I'm not going to go there emotionally. I'm just going to get through it. And so I don't really want to confess or agree or acknowledge how I'm really doing it. Because if I acknowledge how I'm really doing in my flesh, I don't possess the emotional power to get through it. So instead, I'll just play a different game, which is most of us play. We just deny it. We don't really acknowledge it. We don't really get to the root of it. We just say, you know what? I'm just trying to get through the day and wake up tomorrow. I'm surviving. And I've said this before, but God conspired in a unique way in a variety of circumstances in my own life to where in 2017, not very many years ago, a, a, a series of things happened in my life. And for the first time in my life, I had to admit to myself and to others, I don't know what to do here. I don't know what to do. But I've always known what to do. I've always had this power, in, again, in my own self-deception that I knew what to do, that I could make it through, that we would get through. Because I don't really like pain. I'm, I'm the eternal optimist, man. It's always going to be okay. And, and I'm good in, with other people in circumstances. I'm good with their grief. I'm good with their shock. I'm good in those kind of circumstances because I can provide hope. But when it comes to myself, my own optimism, which is my strength, becomes my weakness because I won't actually acknowledge pain. You see that? And I learn, and you learn, and we learn how to power through it. And, and this is why I say this to you in my own life. Now we're three years later, and I'm still learning. I, again, I still don't completely believe that I'm at a place where my flesh is, is ripped out of me enough that I don't think that I can just get through it. And so what God has to do is he has to wrestle us down to the point where our flesh, our old tricks, our old ways no longer work. This is why I told you last week, God gets to the point where he don't play fair. Not that he does, I'm not impugning his character. Obviously, I would never do that. But I'm just pointing out, Jacob wrestles with God all night until God gets to the point, he's like, I'm done wrestling with you. <laughs> hip out of socket. Why is hip? We did this last week. The hip is the strongest part of your body, isn't it? It's the strongest bone structure. It's the strongest muscular structure. It is the point at which everything in your life hinges. So God will touch your strongest point and throw it out. Throw it out of socket. Why? Because he wants you and I to know something. That our real strength is not in our hip. It's in his hands. Our real power is not in our person, but in his. But here's what we have to understand. Freedom has to be forced. It has to be forced. You see this when God frees the nation of Israel, which we'll learn about Israel in just a second. But it was much easier for God to get the people of God out of Egypt than it was for God to get Egypt out of the people of God. Freeing them 
from a location was the easy point, but freeing them from a lifestyle was the hard work. See, new heart, bam, done. New habits takes a lot longer. And so when we step back and look at this and we think, oh God, why are you doing this? What is going on? What is all of this about? Why God is doing it, what it is all about is he's trying to get us to a place of deep change, deep emotional, spiritual transformation. And if you and I just power through it like we have every other circumstance in our life, then guess what he'll do? He'll just increase the pain. This is why, and hear me here, I'll clarify what I mean, but there's a lot of us that have been living with pain for decades that we didn't have to. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, some physical defect or something that happened, you know, it's not necessarily in your control. So, of course, there are circumstances and things that can happen outside of our control. But there's a lot of times where we live with pain for decades simply because we won't quit just trying to power through it. Emotional pain, relational pain, because we won't let God touch us. See, our will wants to win so bad, we don't even like losing to God. And so when God comes to Jacob, he says, listen, sucker, your strength is not in yourself. It's in your soul. It's not in your muscles. It's not in your bones. It's not in your physical person. It's in your inner self. This is why I used to laugh a lot when I used to go to the gym. I don't go as much anymore. And you're like, yeah, I know. No, because I have it in my house, all right? But I would laugh at dudes that would spend hours in the gym building their physical body and zero minutes building their inner body. And so you had dudes that were physical giants and emotional infants. And God's like, not my, not my people. Now, is physical training bad? No, Paul says to Timothy, it is of some value. It's of some value. But godliness is of eternal value. So that's what God is doing. So that's my point. Let's move on. Then verse 26. Then he said, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, here's where we see Jacob learn what we also need to learn. Jacob learns he lost. He lost. But remember Jacob's name. We'll point this out in a second. It means heel grabber. So Jacob is pretty good at holding on to things. But once he loses, once he loses to someone more powerful than him, he learned a lesson. I'm not letting go. See, here's what I want us to see, church. God beats us. He exhausts us to get us to lose. And then at that moment, he never wants us to let him go. So when you lose, never let go. Let me say it to you. After you lose to the Lord, never let go of the Lord. See, Jacob learned something that we all need to learn. He got whipped. He got beat. Someone was stronger with, than him. And then he learned something. Oh, I finally found the one whose blessing I desperately wanted. I thought it was in my earthly father. It wasn't. I stole that. But now I've been beat by the Lord, and he's the one who I really need the blessing from. So he says, I am not letting you go until you bless me. So the moment that we lose, never let go. The moment you're exhausted, from trying to do it yourself, and God says, no, you can't, and you're at that place of no longer powering through, now, because of God's grace in your life, never let go. Why? Here's my next point. After the wrestle, 
comes the revelation. After the wrestle comes the revelation. Look at this story, verse 27, what happens? And he, Jesus, said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. What an interesting interchange. Now, I've already told you, I've, I think this is Jesus. You're going to see in a moment where Jacob himself believes this is God. Do you think Jesus, God in the flesh, asked Jacob what his name was because he was so tired he forgot? No. In fact, anytime God asks a question, we need to know something. It's not for his benefit, it's for ours. God never asks us a question because we have knowledge that he doesn't. Why does God ask Jacob, what is your name? Don't miss this. This came right after Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So he says, okay, you want me to bless you? What's your name? Again, not because he doesn't know, but because he wants Jacob to confess it. Because here's what you need to know. When I use the word revelation, understand what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the word revelation means God is disclosing himself. And so the Bible is the revelation of God. It's God's self-disclosure. It's more than just a book in the Bible. It is the Bible is the revelation of God. But revelation works in two ways. We learn about who he is and we learn about who we are. And so before he can get to who he is, he has to get Jacob to acknowledge who Jacob is. And so remember, names, or maybe I haven't said this yet, so I can't say remember, but I'm going to tell you, then you can remember it, all right? But in the Bible, names indicate nature. So in the Bible, you would be named something that was conducive to your nature, to, to your person. So they named Jacob because he came out deceiving. He'll grab her, right? That's what I was saying earlier. And so they named him Jacob because they already knew that was his nature. So when God asks Jacob, hey, what's your name? Jacob has to confess. And he doesn't just say Jacob in the way we think Jacob. Remember, his name means something. And so Jacob has to say, I am a deceiver. I'm a manipulator. I'm a heel grabber. And everything in my life, up until this point, I have gotten from my own power to manipulate. Why does God ask him for his name? Because he wants Jacob to own who he really is. And that's what confession is. Biblically speaking, confession is simply agreement. I'm agreeing with God that what God says about me is true. I'm agreeing. That's what confession is. And just a little side note here. If you're confessing to somebody, please don't do it like this. I'm sorry you took it that way. That ain't confession, bro. Or I'm sorry you found out. I didn't mean for it to happen like this. What did you think was going to happen? You know, I, when I get high pitched, baby. So, so confession is, so let me say it to you like this. It's not really confession if you're just saying words and not agreeing with it. See, God had to exhaust Jacob. He had to exhaust Jacob's flesh. He had to exalt the hell out of Jacob. And don't, don't hear what I'm not, that's a Bible word. When I'm saying hell, I'm saying the spirit of the devil that conflicts and fights with God. He had to exhaust him to the point where that spirit was whipped and then get him to admit that he lives by that spirit. He lives by that. That's his code. That's who he is. And here's why this is so important. And if you're like, I could never confess this, then you miss the second part. Then he says, the moment he agrees, the moment he confesses, 
Jesus says, that ain't your nature anymore. See, God wants us to own it so he can change it. But he can't change it until we own it. So this is why the gospel, listen to me. This is why the gospel is devastating and glorious all at once. There's nothing like it. There's no other faith system on the planet where you win by losing. There's no other faith structure that is so personally devastating where we have to admit who we are. And the moment we do, God changes us and makes us something different. See, names indicate nature. And so what he was saying to him is, you're not Jacob anymore. I'm renaming you. This is what Pastor David did a few weeks ago when he talked about the fact that if God owns it, he gets to name it. See, Jacob's earthly father gave him the first name, the first nature. His heavenly father gave him his new name and his new nature. You're not Jacob anymore. You're Israel. And what does Israel mean? Israel means, check this, wrestles with God. That's what it means. L is a shortened firm of the word for God. And Isa, Isra, means to wrestle. So now, Jacob, you will no longer be known by your wrestling with men. You'll now be known by your relationship to me. Your name, Jacob, is now Israel. And your new name has my name in your name. Your new name has me in you. You have a new nature now, buddy. You're not who you were because you've striven with God and men and prevailed. Does that mean he won in the physical sense? No, it means he won in the losing sense. And this is why, again, the gospel is such good news because when we lose, we win. When we give up, we gain. When we give, we receive. It doesn't make any physical sense but it makes all the eternal sense because if I'm going to get beat by somebody, I want to get beat by somebody whose primary motive is to bless me. And this is what I want you to see. God breaks us just so he can bless us. He breaks us so he can bless us. This is why communion is so central it's so central to our, our faith in theology because it not only symbolizes what God did with Jesus, but it symbolizes what God does with us. He takes us, he breaks us, he blesses us, he gives us. Why is it when Jesus, after his resurrection, was walking on the road to Emmaus and he's talking to two disciples and they don't know him until he does communion with them? Because it's in that process that we get to know God. And it's in that process that God, not, only, not that he doesn't know us, but, but we're known by him. This is why Paul says, you know God, better yet, you're known by God. So he breaks us just so he can bless us. Look at what happens next. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he says, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. There he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have stri I've seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. That is a Hebrew word that means I've seen God face to face. And here's what I want you to see. The reason God has to break us before he blesses us is because we'll misunderstand what the blessing actually is if he doesn't break us first. One of the greatest I think one of the greatest criticisms of Western theology is we have wrongly misdefined blessings. We have thought that blessings are material because we live in a material world and you're a material girl, right? It's just, it's how we see things. We, we see the here and now. 
And God says, see, if I just blessed you without breaking you, that's what you would think. But once I break you and then I bless you, you will understand something. That the blessing is not something that comes from me. The blessing is me. The blessing is not what God can give to your purse or to your bank account. It is his presence. But think about it. When we even describe heaven, and these are rhetorical questions, but when we describe heaven, do we not, in default, start describing it more like a place? Now, don't email me. Don't add, I, every time I say this, people are like, are you saying heaven's not a place? No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> yes, it's a place. Streets of gold, pearly gates, and no, Peter's not standing there. But heaven is less about a place and it's more about a person. Heaven is simply the place right now where his presence is. Heaven and earth used to be one. And so his presence was one. And then in sin, it was separated. But one of the greatest indictments on us, again, is we even describe heaven more so about a place and let's be honest, and again, I'm not being mean, but we get more excited about seeing our people and our dead dogs than we do Jesus. Now, is Fido going to be there? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell me. There will be animals there. I don't know if they're yours or not. But here's what I can tell you. When you see the Father, you're not going to care about Fido. Because the gospel is this. Jesus didn't die to get you to a place. He died to get you back to a person. That's the gospel. So the gospel is Jesus came, put on flesh, dwelt among us, took the punishment, rose again, sits at the right hand of the Father, will return again, and he will bring heaven and earth back together again. And those are less about places and more about people the father with his kids that's the gospel and so here's why I'm, I'm stressing this because you won't want God above all else until he breaks you of wanting all other things besides him this is why I said it's devastating and glorious it's devastating because you come to the end of everything you thought you knew. But it's glorying, glorious because you become to the beginning of everything he has for you. And no heaven will not be boring, my friends. We will not float up there like angels playing harps like, eh. no, we will sit before the face of God for all eternity, becoming more glorious like him. And he's forever inexhaustible. You and I will never get tired of sitting at his feet and learning from him and becoming like him. This is why the Bible says we will be transformed from one degree of glory to another. You think it's glorious now that you've got the Holy Spirit in you? Wait until you see the Trinity. So you got the Spirit in you, Jesus next to you, the Father before you. Wait till that day. And so Jacob gets to this place, and I want us to get to this place where he responds. He says, oh my, I've seen God face to face. And think about the face. The face has no practical value. But we spend so much time on our faces. Not like on our faces like we should, but making up our faces. Why? And don't hear what I'm saying, ladies. I'm not saying that's bad. Men too. But, but why do we put it on our faces? For the, just the sheer aesthetic beauty of seeing it and be captured by it. See, you know you've been blessed by God when you no longer want his hand and you want his face. 
You no longer want to get what he can give you, but you just want him. You just want to see him and stare at him and learn from him. You see, nobody sees the face of God and comes out the same. Nobody. Look at what happens. Last two verses. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel. It's spelled differently. Don't worry about it. It's not a Bible flaw. It's just multiple ways to spell the same things. Look at this next phrase. Limping because of his hip. The sun rose up as he passed. No, no. Let me translate this for you. The sun rose upon him as he passed the face of God. The sun rose as he passed the face of God, limping because of his hip. You know, some theologians have called this wrestling the dark night of the soul. Because this happened at night. And it gets darkest. It's the darkest right before the dawn. But here's the good news. Here's the gospel. The night will not last forever. The sun will rise. And when the sun rises, you will see the face of God. And when you experience that grace where God overwhelmingly blesses you with his presence in the midst of your grief, you will never walk the same again. Limping because of his hip. Verse 32. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is in the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. See, Jacob walks differently and generations after him live differently. You want to know why we're doing this series? It's because God's trying to get after something that he's been after from the beginning, changing your nature. You want to know why he doesn't wrestle with Jacob for the next day and the next day and the next day? You want to know why? Because God's like, it's time to get after what I've been after the whole time, changing your person. I'm tired of playing with you. And forever, Jacob walked differently. He didn't walk with the limp that we acted out last week. He's now walking Injured, but influenced by God. Why? Because now, when anyone ever asks him, Jacob, why are you walking like that? His response won't be, <laughs> I'm Jacob, bro. You see all my flocks? You see all my herds? You see my wives? You see my kids? You see my crib? That ain't going to be his answer. But now he's going to walk like this. And, and they're going to ask him, Jacob, why are you walking like that? Because I've seen the face of God. And he broke me. And then he blessed me. And you can know this God too. Church, God loves you enough to break you so he can bless you because the greatest blessing he could ever give you is himself. And he wants you to have the fullness of joy forevermore. If you and I can just get to that place where we see his face, we confess who we are, and we receive our new name. We receive our new nature. No longer will we be called by the things that we called ourselves and what others called us. See, 2020 is the hip socket season. It's the breaking of the hip socket season. Because God wants us to be known by something different. He wants us to be known by humility. Not arrogance. Not pride. But he wants us to be known and defined by our relationship with him. 
So that's the revelation that God revealed himself. He allowed himself to be broken so that he could beat the very thing that separated you from him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. God, I know there are people here today that have never gotten to that place where you broke them and blessed them. They've never confessed and agreed that they are a sinner and I need you to save them. So God, I pray right now that would happen. Nobody looking around or talking here as we close, but if you've never trusted Christ, you can surrender today and trust him in your confession. You can pray with me. You don't have to say it out loud. It goes like this. Say, Father, thank you for loving me. That you sent your son and broke him so that you could bless me. So now I confess I'm a sinner. I agree with you, God. And I receive Christ. Would you change my name? And would you change my nature? Save me, forgive me. Now again, nobody looking around or talking, but if you just prayed that with me, you're in one of our locations, we just simply want to know that. Would you just simply lift your hand up so we can see that? Thank you. If you're online and, or in person in just a second, you'll have an opportunity to text us your information so we can know who you are. But then those of us who've trusted Christ, I want you to understand something. The wrestle comes more than once. The dark night comes in different seasons. And so if that's been you in this season where you've been wrestling with God, don't power through. Surrender, give up. But then never let go. Never, ever, ever, ever let go. Because he wants to bless you. And he will reveal a part of himself that you could have never known unless this pain came. So ask him for it. Say, God, bless me with you. Thank you for breaking me. Bless me. Father, thank you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.